WBJC presents Inside Gene Shepherd. Uh, too much leeway, too much rope. <laughs> Give the rats a little rope by George and they'll play. That's a mixed metaphor, isn't it? I love a little mixed metaphors at night with just a little tomato sauce, a little garlic, a little pepper, a little uh, Romano cheese. Ah, dee -dee. Thank you, Jim. Bring it up large. Ah, dee -dee. Jim, I got one of these little eight-digit uh, electronic calculators, you know, and it's got a memory. And it sits in the corner now and just sits and looks sad and unhappy, <laughs> thinking back over its own wasted youth. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. Hey, you know, it wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be sad today to, to uh, I mean, you know, with all the calculators and all that jazz going on, if you had a warehouse full of, of beautiful uh Magnificent uh, log log desitrig slide rules, <laughs> complete with uh, uh, alligator skin cases. You ever had a good slide rule? Well, you know that they're not cheap, right? Well, I imagine they're pretty cheap now. I mean, <laughs> compared to what they used to be. But uh, you know, things go on. Like like uh, one of our listeners writes in. He's a shepherd. He said, uh, and I'm going to bring this right to your attention. We have to bring these things to your attention. So, shepherd, here it says. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, here it is. It says, um, he says, I don't see how anyone can say that Mayor Beam is too old. He's beginning to sound more like Holden Caulfield every day. <laughs> All right. Did you, you don't know who... What's the matter, Lee? Don't you know who Holden Caulfield is? Yeah, you know, the kvetcher? Right. The phony spotter? Well, uh, okay. I have to explain the joke to you. And uh, while we're on the subject of uh, jokes here, if I may... Every time, uh, oh yeah, it says there's a commercial. It says, Shepard, you got to get this commercial on your show. It says, it's uh, very symbolic that you have a corn remedy on your show. I think that's uh, symbolic, and not only symbolic, it's more than symbolic. It's, uh, it's only poetic justice and irony. But uh, he also says there's a great commercial, which I never heard. He says on the air, it's for a rat poison. And uh, yeah, it's a rat poison. And one of the lines in the commercial is, guess who's coming to dinner? Ben! <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, it's kind of sad. I had a letter from a friend of mine, uh, for those of you who are movie star fans, and uh, New York abounds in them. You know, New York can't take reality any longer. It's, it's gone to the movies en masse. You know, it's, it really it spends all of its time watching Robert Redford, you know, walk around with a fake beard on, pretending he's a prospector. That's called art. But uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> New York is, you know, it's gone to the movies. You can't stand it. And a friend of mine wrote to me from Hollywood, a buddy of mine's a director out there, and he says, Shepard, he says, this town's getting crazy. He says, it's getting worse and worse. He says, the other day he goes into Schwab's drugstore, which is right on the strip there, you know. And that's the drugstore that reputedly is where Lana Turner was discovered, sitting there having a strawberry milkshake. For those of you who've been thinking, yogurt, yogurt's going to do it for you. It wasn't yogurt that did it for Lana Turner. 
But, uh, <laughs> well, if the yogurt does it for you, friend, more power to you. And uh, nevertheless, uh, he wrote to me, and uh, you may be interested in this, Jim, because this, my, he's my West Coast spy. He said the other day he's in uh, in Schwab's, and he said it was really a very interesting moment in Schwab's. He said because uh, uh, sitting in the booth down there having a hell of a row with his agent, because he hasn't been working for over a year, it was Ben. And uh, he says, uh, you know, he's a real showbiz rat these days. And he says, what's so funny about it? He said, you know, he wears these shades, and he's got this uh, jazzy-looking polyester suit and the whole bit, you know, flares and everything, you know. And uh, he comes in there with his agent, and he says, and what was weird about it? He says, you couldn't tell him apart. He says, of course, you know how agents are. I do. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Almost all the agents I know could double for Ben any time. All right. Uh, okay, let's return to reality here. You know, some guy, some guy wrote to me the other day saying, uh, said, Shepard, uh, you hardly ever tell stories about uh, your experiences in showbiz. He said, uh, no, he said, you know, and I, I never do. I, I just never tell. Uh, it's funny about, uh, you know, what happens really in, in, uh, in the world of uh, showbiz. And, uh, you know, everybody has different experiences. But I'll tell you, he says, what, Shepard? He said, what was the most educational experience you ever had in show business? Well, I'm going to have to tell you this. Now, do we have any time? How much time do we have? This is a, this is a, we got plenty of time. Well, now you stick around because no more commercials, gang. You can relax now. And uh, so you can just turn the radio back up there so you can hear it again. Come out of the job. Come on now, Gladys. It's time to listen to the program again. There you go. Hey, right, put down the, put down the Frito-Lays there. There, okay. And yeah, maybe that's your problem. You've been putting them down too much. Look at you. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story now, and I, I don't think I've ever told this story. I might as well tell it to you, though, because it, it got, me, got me thinking, you know. The stories that happen to you in showbiz, you know, things that go on, don't have much to do with what the public thinks is the funniest things, like the time the guy thought the microphone was turned off. How many times have you heard that canard? That's ridiculous. Every time I ever heard a guy say something really great into a microphone, he knew damn well it was turned on. It was only later that he pretended he thought it wasn't on. <laughs> well, uh, what, what, uh, what makes me think of the story that I'm about to tell you is that I have to explain something to you. Just, uh, I just read a piece. For those of you who, who are just suddenly coming into country music here in, the, in uh, New York, you must realize that we are making ourselves, New York is making itself, as it often does in the last few years, the laughing stock of the nation. Some of the worst dribble ever written about uh, country uh, western stuff is being written in New York in such uh, stellar uh, papers as the uh, Village Voice, you know, who just discovered C&W about eight months ago. And uh, they're writing the, the stuff that uh, is so silly that it makes you embarrassed if you know anything about the subject. You know, it's like your Aunt Clara trying to explain a Thelonious Monk to you. You know, it's like it's like you got your Aunt Emily and said, Emily, Aunt Emily, would you please write the, up what you think of uh, of Ornette Coleman? Uh, well, that's about what you're getting out of Nat Hantoff and his uh, his attempts to deal with C and W. But uh, here's what one of the country. Uh, this is from a Southern newspaper. And uh, I'm going to read this to you to give you an idea of what they think about us in, the, in other parts of the country uh, uh, in connection with C&W music. And that's connected with the story I'm about to tell you, because I got my start in this business in C&W, not as a disc jockey, but as a performer. I, was, I, I sang and I, I played the bass with an outfit called Chuck Acre and his Colorado Cowhands long before Nat Hentoff even thought of uh, not writing about Coleman Hawkins. But uh, uh, here's what they say down south. Now listen, Lee, don't keep writing. Just keep listening now here for a minute. New York is trying to turn on the country music. It won't work. The New York Times was trying to write about the boom in country music recently. I'm, I'm quoting this paper. The New York Times is usually a fairly literate music uh, paper. In fact, very literate. Regarding country music, the New York Times should totally give up. So, in fact, should New York. 
The Country Music Association convened a three-hour hoedown at the Plaza Hotel for Madison Avenue ad agency men. That's a quote, the story said, and we quote, and the country music at the Katzka Resorts has been added to kosher cuisine, end of quote. Furthermore, and this is a quote, I think the New York public today, and this are quoting the Times, I think the New York public today is really groping for a new sound, which we haven't had since rock and roll, and country music could be it, uh, end of quote, said Sal Shapiro of the William Morris Agency. And then, the, then this newspaper says, yes, yeah, Sal, sure, baby. It says, listen to the New York Times story. If you know country music, it will really break you up. And I agree. It's, I read that piece in the Times, and I almost, uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's not often that you see a man actually rolling in the aisles with laughter on the double-A train. And I was rolling in the aisles and, <laughs> and laughed. I thought I was throwing another fit, you know. Here it says, quote, country lyrics speak of loneliness, of heartbreak, of yearnings that can never be fulfilled, of parole, of infidelity, of working on the road gang by day and going stepping by night, end of quote. You know, that, that was out of the Times. He's quoting the Times. And then he goes on to say, he says, wouldn't it be interesting <laughs> in all that patronizing city slickerism to get some insight into what the New York Times thinks a road gang is? <laughs> it says they make it sound rather like a field hockey time at Bennington. And, good buddy, grab this here in depth an analysis. This is a guy talking about the Southerners. And, good buddy, grab this in depth analysis. Quote, country music lyrics make Cole Porter sound as abstruse and inaccessible as Albert Einstein. They frequently reflect a simplistic philosophy. Quote, if a tree don't fall on me, I'll live till I die. End of quote. Now, here's where he explains it. He says, now, you must understand, any town that thinks that line is, quote, simplistic, thinks hee-haw is simple-minded and will never, never understand that the basis of broad country talk and humor is a continual, subtle self-put-on. That is true. Well, they didn't understand that's a, that's a put-on. It's anything but simple. It says, the funniest part is the city slickers think we are simple. A town that cannot understand that will not understand country music ever. And I think New York City will be one place in the nation that is simply too wised up to learn anything it doesn't already know. That is why New Yorkers are the funniest people of all, he says. And then he says, anyhow, that simplistic line was misquoted. The actual line is, quote, from Tex Ritter's Rye Whiskey. And it is correctly quoted. It goes like this, quote, it's whiskey, rye whiskey. It's whiskey, I cry, and if whiskey don't kill me, I'll live till I die. The problem uh, with New York is that it will be deep down afraid of country music because New Yorkers are highly intuitive. They will know immediately they do not understand country music, and they are too selective to settle for the pap which will be thrown at them in the guise of forced-fed country music. For instance, anybody who thinks Glenn Campbell is a country singer <laughs> simply doesn't know country music. Anybody who thinks Dean Martin is not a country singer, basically, does not understand. Now, that threw you a curve, didn't it? A lot of people these days are passing as country singers. This is because there is no pop, and country is the only place they can do their ballads. But they are not any more country than Eddie Arnold is country. Anybody who thinks Eddie Arnold is country probably thinks Bobby Darren isn't. That's a very interesting, subtle line. That would really elude uh, uh, Nat Hintoff. Uh, it says, you would find New York full of uh, both deluded schools. Country is now full of annoyingly shrill and maudlin ersatz bathos peddlers like those god-awful, quote, Saturday morning confusion uh, things and anything by Bobby Goldsboro or John Denver. It says, let's turn now. <laughs> So anyway, I'm sitting there reading, I say, and that's true. I tell you, I get so embarrassed when I when I hear people here in town, especially, you know, DJs that are doing it here in town, talk about country music. It's really embarrassing. It's like it's honest. It's it's like getting uh, Kurt Gowdy to do a, j a jazz disc show. You know, it's really embarrassing. And now playing from the heart and right out of New Orleans is, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, the, the, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my my uh, my showbiz life is is a fantastic week that I once spent with Jerry Lee Lewis. You talk about if you guys don't know anything about country, 
if if you talk about a country singer now sure he he's he's done his rock in the time but the rock folk didn't understand what jerry lee was saying was laying down nobody was more surprised than jerry lee to discover that he was a big deal in rock but jerry lee is about as close to a a a uh a psalm shouting, hymn shouting, a Bible thumping, C and W singer as you'll ever find this side of uh, Waycross, Georgia. And in fact, one night I was in the rain, a driving, fantastic rain with Jerry, Jerry Lee, and we're sitting in this trailer, and it's a, uh, it's out in, uh, it, it's in a field, a, a red dirt field deep in the heart of Georgia, with the rain coming down, and the entire one half of the field filled with 1957 pickup trucks covered with red dirt and a great long line of guys wearing overalls with red-faced women carrying babies all <laughs> all waiting in line to hear Jerry Lee and Jerry Lee is in, is in this is in this uh in this trailer say and he's wearing this wild looking tuxedo which he puts on I said Jerry you, look at that wild suit you got he says man he says that's what they come for they want to see that he says, they can see overalls any place. I won't wear it. He says, they love this. Love this, man. And I says, Jerry, I said, look at you. And the rain is beating down. And his sister is sitting there eating, eating a peach and uh, crying. She just had a wild argument with her boyfriend on the telephone. She keeps holding my arm and saying, Gene, why don't you get on the phone and say something to him? He's just being bad to me, bad to me. You get on the phone. And I said, come on. I don't have time to talk to you. And Linda Lee, now come on, let me go. And Jerry's sitting there, and the rain is pouring down. And all of a sudden, out in the out in the tent, you hear this great crowd roar. There, it's a tent. Now remember, and and the crowd is now assembled in the tent. The rain is pouring down so hard that it's like a circus tent. See, it's really a revival tent, is what it is. And and uh, they had all these wooden benches stretched all the way out in the back. And the band is starting to play. See, they're playing great balls of fire. They're playing the opening line. See. <laughs> And Jerry Lee, Jerry Lee runs out in the rain. And both of us tear through this mud. See, and we get out into the, we get out of the back of the this tent, and uh, Jerry jumps up on us on the piano on the platform, little deep, little tiny platform. It's made out of looks like pieces of plywood, you know. And he jumps up on the top of this thing, and it's rickety. It's weaving back and forth because it's made out of old sawhorses. And he jumps up there, and he's wearing this fantastic tuxedo with a pearl colored shirt. And, and at that point, the crowd roars, unbelievable. Little ladies are holding up babies and screaming and yelling. And uh, they, they play a couple more bars of Great Balls of Fire. And at that point, uh, uh, Jerry looks down. He says, hi, folks. And everybody screams again. He says, I'm going to sing something about it. I'm going to tell you what it's all about. And he says, I'm going to start singing. And he starts to sing this tune, you know. And the minute he starts to sing this one, see, everybody's sitting down there. He's got the uh, guys are holding up cans of Paps Blue Ribbon. And Jerry starts to sing. And the band starts playing. It's just a Glen Campbell, gang. And the crowd roars. It's late and she's waiting. We was and right down. We was right down the road from Hawk Creek, Georgia. But every time that old Hawk I Creek, Georgia, the water pouring down off the yellow and the red song. clay hills was making a Russian sound just outside Someone of the tent. Jerry Lee's up there sweating and sitting there at the piano. He's taking great big swigs out of a half gallon jug of Pabst Blue Ribbon and singing. Now, if the New York Times is ever going to quite understand all the ramifications of this. Me not to go <laughs> so yeah, many times what made Milwaukee so famous is made a loser out of me. love and happiness can't live behind those And I hate to tell you this, Nat. Now she's gone. When you grow up in a state like Indiana, where by the age of four, every kid from miles around plays either the jew's harp, the banjo, or a cigar box fiddle, and uh, Ernest Tubb could be elected dictator of the world any time he decides to run, you get to know something about this. Those long nights, listen to the WLS barn dance. Jerry Lee sitting up on top of the piano. Babies begged me not to go So many times before Probably one of the purest C&W singers around is she Elvis. Don't you kid yourself. You are great? Now she's 
gone. You notice that piano? Well, he learned that singing hymns. That's right out of the hymn singing. That's a, pia- that's a hymn piano. He famous. He's made a loser out of me. But made me walk. He's famous. Has made a loser out of me. Yeah, Jerry, lay it down, boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. That's now. Now. Uh, <laughs> now I'm going to get to the, the, the to the nitty gritty of the story. You only understand country music when you understand the places where it's played. It ain't played by disc jockeys. That's right. There's only two places that country music is really what it is. You want to know what that is? That's a place they call Jukin. When you go, when you go, when you go from bar to bar in, in places like Rabbit Hash, Kentucky, and. Uh, and you go in there, and all these guys are sitting around with their mean looks and their their uh, very very uh, <laughs> well endowed ladies. You go in there, and and you you juke, you know. That's that's uh, now. Where's the other place you hear? Well, I'll tell you. You hear it in places again, like places in uh, Haw Creek, Georgia, where uh, C and W bands are working. Now, that's something else again. Now this is uh, this is something that unless you have experience, and nothing to do with a C and W concert. Oh, there's a whole different mystique when you sit in this dark, uh, dingy place called uh, Ed's Golden Eagle Bar and Grill. And uh, I worked in a place called Ed's Golden Eagle Bar and Grill. If you want to know where it was, it was in Mattoon, Illinois. And I was there with the, with the, with the group Chuck Acre and the Colorado Cowheads. It's very dark in those places, see. And to begin with, there's no such thing as an age limit. You're either big enough or you ain't. And if you're big enough, you is. And that's it. You do it. Now, <laughs> so here I was. I was a cool 16, and uh, I came in there with my bass. At that time, I, I had a bass, which I, I uh, was, it was uh, the biggest thing I owned in my life. I had this bass, and I had my set of Jews harps, and I had uh, the costume provided by Chuck Acre, uh, which uh, consisted of a blue leather chaps. We had blue ones. Oh, yes. And uh, you know the kind, the big blue things on the side there? And it had imitation silver studs with fringe hanging down. You know, you've seen those. And, and, uh, and picked out in gold rivet heads. Running down each side, it said Colorado. On the other side, cow hands. And uh, so Chuck, Aiken, by the way, Chuck was from Colorado. He really was. He was from Golden, Colorado. And uh, Chuck, Chuck, uh, I'll tell you, Chuck, Chuck had the greatest nose for singing through. I've ever heard in my life. This guy, <laughs> he was great. So, and, and pick, I'll tell you, Chuck Aker could pick that guitar like, uh, I mean, it was, it was obscene. So, uh, we, we go in, uh, we pull into uh, the uh, Golden Eagle Bar and Grill, and uh, we, we set up all our stuff. We're all ready to go, see. And so, we've been booked in there now for about a week. These are little things that happen to you, see. So, we've booked in there for about a week, and, and, uh, the crowd starts coming in, you know, whatever they were, you know, the people drifting in from the bolt and rivet factory down the street, you know, places like that. And uh, so we warm up the crowd with a couple of quick courses of uh, Orange Blossom Special, which, uh, which, by the way, our theme, if you want to know what our theme was, I'll give you a clue. I'll listen to how it goes. It goes, da 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 Right, steel guitar blues. So uh, yeah, Chuck, that was Chuck's big thing. So he had the steel guitar, and then, and uh, so steel guitar blues. We ring out a couple of courses of that, and we start them off with Wabash Cannonball, Orange Blossom Special. You know, you you, you start them off with the with the old classics. You know, it really gets draws them in. See, and and we're working away when all of a sudden Ed comes back, and, and he he says he says, hey, I want to talk to Chuck. And I'm standing back there playing the bass. He says, well, he's busy. He's singing. He said, well, you tell me after this number, I got to talk to him. He said, after this number, I got to talk to him. So I said, okay. So I'm playing the bass with, and, and we, we finished the number, which, uh, which uh, by the way, uh, was, was Chuck's own composition. And uh, it says, uh, I'm going to hell and gone. Was a tune that Chuck just loved. He plays up. Uh, I'm going to hell and gone. I, I never heard it. Well, I knew a guy that wrote a tune. How about that one? My life ain't worth a damn. 
Now, that's a great title for a C&W song because that's, now they don't realize that's a subtle put down too. So I'm up there playing away there, see, and I said, hey, Chuck, Chuck, Ed wants to talk to you. Chuck said, what do you want? He said, we're right in the middle of the set. And Ed leans over and he says, Sheriff just come in. And Chuck says, what do you want? He said, I don't know. He says, he's looking for Chuck Acre. And Chuck says, what for? He says, well, I don't know. He just says he's going to wait in the bar for you. At that point, Chuck finished the last chorus of Hell and Gone. And he says, uh, you, you, he says, uh, don't, don't none of you guys, uh, don't none of you guys move. He says, just, just keep playing. And so we started to play like crazy. See, Chuck steps off the stand, turns around, walks around the back. That's the last time I saw Chuck Acre. Now, <laughs> I'm telling you that we play, we play for an hour and a half, wait for Chuck to come back, and he he left. In ca in fact, even took the Oldsmobile station wagon. And I'll tell you, we went home that night on the Greyhound bus, and Ed was very mean about it. And uh, so the, you you learn about you learn about the world of uh, doing these things, which uh, I'm sure that uh, now I'll tell you one of the great moments though that I've had in showbiz, one of the fantastic moments. I was uh, again, this was with Chuck Acrecy, and uh, this was. Uh, when we were just starting to work around places like uh, Calumet City, Illinois, oh, one of my favorite places was the Doll House in Calumet City. Oh, they had some dolls, I'll tell you. And uh, another place I like, too, <laughs> you notice I'm slipping into the accent, another place that they, they had there was the Capitol Lounge and the Riptide, Smokey Joe's Riptide. Now, that was, that was worthy of uh, something right out of a, you know, like right out of a movie starring uh, Jimmy Cagney. But... Uh, Nevertheless, uh, this this one great night, we had our, our our big big break. There was this radio station, see, and they come down, and they they wanted us to come on a Saturday and do a live show. Well, everybody was excited seeing the band. So, uh, and it, not only it's going to be a live show, but they're going to have an invited audience. They're going to have maybe three or four hundred people there. See, well now we had. Uh, that uh, you know that night we had a meeting so everybody got together and chuck says now look says, we're gonna have to rehearse this is the first time we're gonna rehearse now we're gonna rehearse we're going on the radio and you never know who might be listening to the radio maybe somebody from decca records or maybe even king records you never know and uh, we may be just recording it and doing it all so we rehearsed and he added a couple of guys to the band and he added he added the greatest fiddle player i ever heard in my life a guy named skeeter skeeter must have weighed about oh 60 70 pounds and uh yeah he had that mean little pinched face uh you know the kind of uh, you know that kind of you know the kind i'm talking about you 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 know you know enough about cnw music and you've been in enough places like that to know that little mean face that kind with the eyes set real close together and and he always was squinting and he had these bright blue eyes and a red face, and uh, had the mean look in the eye, see, but my God, but that man could play. He could play, he had this fiddle, which he held down low, you see, he'd lean this baby down low like that, in the crook of his arm, and he'd just take that bow, and the fiddle was just absolutely white with rosin. <laughs> that fiddle was white with rosin. He had gum stuck on the back of it, where he'd finished chewing his gum, he'd stick it on the back of his fiddle, and, and uh, that guy could play, I'll tell you, uh, how many of you know uh, what's one of the great uh, one of the great fiddle tunes the devils come on come on ah, we'll, we'll, we'll give me a test here on, on uh, country music I'll ask that in that hand what's what's a great country western classic fiddle playing okay so he's got this fiddle down see and he he holds it real low and he sort of leans in when he plays. See, when, when he'd play, he'd lean in to the audience, just sort of lean like a post that was being blown from the back. See, absolutely no expression except that mean look in the eye. And he played, he played more I'd ever heard in my life. So Skeeter was, you know, going to be the big thing. Skeeter and, of course, Chuck Acre's steel guitar. Well, on the Saturday morning that we arrived for the, for the big show, I'll tell you, there was... 300 people packed in there, you know, there was going to be a, a free, uh, free C&W show on the radio, and uh, they'd given away tickets at the A&P and down at the, down at the, 
<laughs> down at the A&W root beer stand, they were giving away free tickets so everybody comes. They, well, there was a big crowd of people sitting there. They were standing up around the walls. And this announcer, I'd never really seen a real announcer before that. And this announcer came on right before the show, see, and he says, now I want all of you to just, just have a good time in here. He says, the boys are all here. He says, we're going to be broadcast to five other radio stations this morning. He says, we got a network. And not only that, he said, folks, we're being sponsored. We're sponsored. Let's give a cheer for the sponsor. Purina Chick Chow. And the crowd cheers. You know, Purina Chick Chow in the checkered bag. Yep, if you got slow laying hens, if them hens are laying slow, Purina special laying Chick Chow mash. Right, in the checkered bag. Well, just mix it up with water, and them chicks will just lay fa eggs faster, and you can pick them up like machine guns. They come out, you know? So... Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, we all got in there, see, and, and, and all of us arrived separately. See, each guy drifts into the studio there, and I'm in there, and Chuck is in there, and uh, we, had a, we had a guy that uh, played the dobro and, and did a little singing, and uh, a couple of other guys drift in. No skier. So about five minutes before the show, you know, Chuck's getting excited. So Chuck says, listen, he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, we're going to cut down, he says, we're going to cut out them hoedowns. He says, let's uh, write them hoedowns out that Skeeter's going to play and forget that devil thing. He says, forget that that uh, that breakdown. We ain't going to play that either. He said, uh, we're going to start right out with, uh, let's see, we'll take steel guitar. And uh, what we'll do is, uh, uh, how about, uh, how about, let's start out with, uh, oh, he said, the hell, how about Orange Blossom? We'll start with Orange Blossom, right? And uh, we'll move on from there. He's just watch me, so I'll give the finger. So, we, we're waiting to go, and in the studio, suddenly from the back comes Skeeter. And he is with the biggest, meanest, wildest-looking blonde lady I ever saw in my life. Her hair was so blonde, it lit up. Have you ever seen Dolly Parton's hair? Her hair reaches up in the sky like she's got about four or five stories of hair. Well, I'll tell you, that would be only the ground floor of it is this blonde's hair. She had hair that almost scraped the ceiling, you know, great big beehive that went all the way up there. She had earrings that jingled, and she had purple eyes, and she, I'll tell you, she was wearing something that looked like it was sprayed on her, and it was both staggering, and she, uh, she was fantastic. In fact, poor little Skeeter come up to right about, I'd say, right about the bottom rib, roughly. See, the little the guy is, I've noticed in my life, the smaller the guy, the bigger the women he likes. Have you noticed that? And vice versa. The bigger the guy, the smaller the lady he goes for. So Skeeter comes in with his big lady, and they come in there like that, and Skeeter's got his get his his fiddle. It's dragging behind him, and he is drunker than a skunk. Unbelievable. And they, she shoves him into the studio, and he just falls flat on his face. The crowd gives a big cheer, and we come out with steel guitar blues. They did it do. And at that point, Chuck turns around. He says, go get Skeeter. I said, well, he's, he's laying on the floor. He says, go get him. He says, don't make no difference. He plays him better. So I run down through the audience, and I pick up Skeeter, and two of the audience help me carry him up to the stand, and he's dragging his, he's dragging his fiddle with him. At that point, Chuck just turns to him and says, it's a Skeeter. Skeeter, Tallahassee breakdown. Can you hear? And Skeeter says, what? He says, Tallahassee breakdown, Skeeter. We're playing now. Now, one, two, three, four. And at that point, he starts to play unbelievable. And I am holding him up on one side, and Chuck Akery's holding him up on the other. His face is completely impassive. There ain't no expression. His eyes are closed. He is somewhere down in Louisiana in his mind. He is playing. He's bombed out of his head. And you could just smell his cheap gin and his cheap wine coming out of his shoes. He's playing like crazy. Well, he finishes this breakdown. He just finishes the crowd cheers, and we lay him down on the, just lay him flat out on the, on the, on the stage there. Nobody's giving a big hand, you know, and he just lays there with his, with his fiddle beside him. At that point, we played something like a Wabash Cannonball, and then we had another Skeeter special. I just reached down, grabbed one side, Chuck grabs the other, and he says, uh, come on, give us the, give us the devil's romp. Come on, devil's romp, let's go. And he says, oh, 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 oh. he starts to play. And between every and every, we just lay him down. Well, now you see, when you, I might add, I never heard fiddling like that in my life. I'll tell you, he was unbelievable. And uh, that night, I learned a lot about life. I can't figure out what it is I learned. <laughs> oh, so you want to hear some more showbiz stories? I could tell you hour after hour. What about that time in Des Moines? I'll never forget that time when we caught the last bus. We had to sell the guys out. In Baltimore, WBJC is National Public Radio.